you are watching The Context. It's time for our new weekly segment, AI Decoded. We've got a lot to get to get through, but we begin with the Financial Times and the godfather of artificial intelligence who's issued a stark warning about the technology in a lecture at the University of Oxford. The Washington Post says top military officials at the Pentagon are meeting with AI experts to accelerate the discovery and implementation of the most useful military AI applications. Meanwhile, on the giant freaking robot science website, the University of Cambridge is proposing using remote kill switches and lockouts to mitigate a potential AI apocalypse. Creative publication Ad Age argues when it comes to creativity, having a human touch is irreplaceable and human traits like empathy and strategic thinking make all the difference. Upworthy focuses on artificial intelligence, unlocking our past and how college students are using AI to decode an ancient scroll burned following an eruption by Mount Vesuvius. Some of these texts, they say, could completely rewrite the history of key periods of the ancient world. And finally, in the independent, ChatGPT apparently suffered a recent breakdown with users complaining the AI system started speaking nonsense and was sending out alarming messages. Well, I said there was a lot to get to, didn't I? With me is Priya Lakhani, who's the CEO of Century Tech, an artificial intelligence education technology company that develops AI-powered learning tools. Hello to you. Hi. So look at all your papers. You've got, you're, you are good to go. First thing, let's go back to uh, the Financial Times. Uh, the headline, yeah. how fatalistic should we be on AI? Yeah. This is a speech by Geoffrey Hinton. Why should we care about what he says? So Geoffrey Hinton, as you said, is the godfather of AI. So he essentially worked with teams and invented some of the key uh, techniques uh, and architecture that allows us to have artificial intelligence the way that we do today, right? So um, we should listen to him. He's a very, very serious, very, very intelligent individual. So he's done this Oxford lecture. This is not the first time he's given this warning, Sarah, right? Mm. So his issue, and, and this is a really bold statement, he said it was a very strong claim. He thinks that these models, these AI models, like the, the, the chat GPT, the llama, all of these different types of large language models that create this generative AI, that they have this level of understanding. Okay, and that's a really, really big claim because what most people say is no, it's just a lot of pattern recognition. You take a lot of data, like the internet, all the, all the data from the internet, you throw it through these models, you've got these algorithms and it, it shoots out an output. And the output with AI is, is always a probability. Is, this pro is the probability of this word, is it, is it the highest of being the correct word? Whereas he's saying they're starting to display a level of understanding and that's quite a scary proposition. They aren't just statistical, um, you know, pattern recognition. Well, so they're and kind so of learning. They're learning. And so, and so in this article, John Thornhill, who's one of my favourite writers at, at the FT, also, you know, he talks about Noam Chomsky and how he contrasts human linguistic abilities rooted in genetics um, to machines that lack an inherent understanding of language. The, the issue is, is that, I mean, Geoffrey Hinton's, you can't ignore what he's saying. Um, but at the same time, you know, I have to say that I, I'm sort of on the side of people who, you know, his critics who are saying, look, how, how does this stuff actually work? And when we get to one of the later articles, you'll see actually how some of these models can spurt out a load of nonsense and, and they're not quite human. But what's really important about his warnings that are true is that he's warning about um, essentially, you know, racing ahead with the developments of technology. Why? Because he's saying this could be massive job displacement, mm. disinformation and deep fakes, which in every segment of AI Decoded, we've generally covered deep fakes. And then he says that what if AI evolves with these intentions to control? And just to give you a little bit of context, there was a research paper by, um, by a group who simulated the Othello board game. And all they did with a GPT was train it with the moves of Othello, the board game, but it didn't, they didn't give the GPT, they didn't train it with the rules of the board game. Mm. And actually what they found at the end was that through this bit of research, the GPT understood the board game, what it was like and the rules. And so there's an argument that eventually uh, these sorts of language models could understand the rules of the world and world order. And then we can go to that really, really fantastic global abductive reasoning test, the duck test. And okay. there you can say, look, if it walks like, if it, if it swims like a duck, if it quacks like a duck and it looks like a duck, yeah. it's probably a duck. 
And so that's where you get this huge issue of people saying, does it matter if it understands or if it's simulating understanding? So many and big issues. Issue. So many big issues. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the Washington Post um, because this is uh, military. And uh, one of the things actually Hinton was talking about was pointing that our government's putting profits before safety. And when that comes to something like military, I think everybody's alarm bells start ringing. They do, although, you know, so the Washington Post have got this piece about uh, the Pentagon talking to tech industry leaders saying, you know, how can we leverage AI in the future, but, but safely. Mm. Uh, but actually what AI is fantastic at doing is analysing a lot of information faster than human capabilities, right? So what they're initially talking about is, for example, intelligence, intelligence gathering. For example, if you have conversations that you know, where you have the transcripts of what people are saying. For a human to go through and analyse a lot of that, a vast amount of that, takes an enormous amount of resource and an enormous amount of effort. So can we leverage artificial intelligence for those purposes? So for intelligence analysis. And then they've looked at training uh, officers. So can we train uh, members of the military in terms of wartime scenarios? Although, two weeks ago, we covered a story with Christian Fraser on this programme about, yeah, from the Mail. And the Mail basically had a terrifying study where they looked at AI large language models and what they would do in five military conflict scenarios and nearly all of them went to war and some of them nuclear pretty quickly. So the AI is clearly not there and that was very well recognised uh, during uh, this particular conference. But there are efficiencies that can be gained and they're not going to stop. And it's just like nuclear. Do you want nuclear weapons in the world at all, at all, ever? No. But the problem is, is there's an arms race. There's a race for countries to, to build AI quicker mm. than the other country over there. I did think it was, I, I thought it was quite interesting in the article where it talks about on Tuesday, the Pentagon began meetings with tech industry leaders using, talking about AI. Surely, they, I mean, normally the military are, are out the front and, and they're using the technology before everyone's even caught up. Do you know, I think, I think where that's from is later down in the article, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a began meetings. However, OpenAI really interestingly removed restrictions against military applications from its usage policies page only in January. So I think that it is possible that because they were having those meetings and this conference, there are lots of people vying for military contracts, which are nice and juicy and large, aren't they? Yeah. So it seems like there'll be commercial relationships. Although the British were there, and the British said, actually, we're going to develop our own large language model solution, our own big AI solution, because we've got concerns that our staffers otherwise might be tempted to put in very, very sensitive data into these, these other models that are operated and owned by you know, third parties. And obviously, that's not safe. Can we move on to the article, yeah. uh, Giant Freaking Robots? Uh, AI apocalypse kill switches could save humanity. Yeah. No nothing like dramatic headlines. <laughs> <laughs> it is a really dramatic headline. And so it's talking essentially about um, having a switch that's fitted into the underlying hardware. What's really, really important about this, okay, you've got these three key components to have artificial intelligence. So you have all this data, you train these algorithms on, you have the algorithms, okay, and then you have compute power. Right, so you've got the compute power that's used to execute the algorithms, right, and execute the models. For the compute power, you have chips. So NVIDIA, for example, you've seen the share price rocket mm. recently. You've got these computer chips that are trading anywhere between like twenty to forty thousand dollars a chip, and they're basically they go through a design, fabrication, and testing phase, and then they're distributed to these data centers. So you can't have AI without them. The paper's brilliant. This paper is brilliant. I read the whole thing. And what they're saying is they're saying, look, it's really actually quite difficult to regulate um, the software producers, the people who are developing the algorithms and creating the, the training data, OK? Because mm. they could be anyone, right? Yeah. But actually, it's the, the supply of AI chips is highly inelastic. There are only a handful of parties in the world that do that. So actually, if we create governance models over the, uh, the producers of the chips, Right then, you have at least a point of governance that could be pretty critical for policymakers if you want to have visibility and track and assess the, de de the development of AI. If you want to influence who can actually create AI, you can stop chips being given to various parties where you think they might use it for nefarious purposes. Then you can enforce standards. So if you see a rogue output somewhere out there in the world, can you trace the output to the AI model the AI model to the data center and then essentially switch off and then switch it off that model mm. and then it has a brilliant uh, suggestion that it requires compute providers to have something similar to banking providers like KYC you know your customer checks so the idea is that you can then have that traceability it, okay. honestly for anyone who's interested in regulation in governments who hasn't read that paper it is it's absolutely brilliant and I recommend that they do okay there we go that's a that's an interesting one now this yeah. is really absolutely fascinating upworthy um, the concept of 
a scroll that was burned to a crisp almost at Mount, when Mount Vesuvius erupted yeah. 2,000 years ago, but now using AI, people are being able to decipher what's written. is yeah. quite astonishing. It's astonishing. So they're using computer vision, um, 3D scanning, and then machine learning to essentially be able to see by... So they virtually, there's, there's a film of this, they virtually unwrap the scroll and it's brilliant. And you can see it in the scroll challenge, the Vesuvius scroll challenge. And then the idea is the ink's actually invisible to the human eye. So then they use these scanning techniques. Um, they, they read <laughs> using AI um, the actual, the, the text. And then these teams are asked to help decipher them. And it was this amazing uh, Dr. Brent Seals who pioneered all of this. And they had some of the AI models, but then they had a small team. So by launching a challenge, this is what's great about AI, if you mm. launch a challenge, you get lots more people involved, lots more data, then actually you can, you can do a lot more. So it's phenomenal. And it's, you know, this is the intersection of archaeology and artificial intelligence. So of all the examples I've ever given of AI on this program, I've never really talked about archaeology. And it is absolutely phenomenal. Well, I'm um, very pleased. I'm very pleased that you started here. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an incredible thing. It's such a futuristic thing, artificial intelligence, but allowing us to learn about our past, our descendants. It's, it is a fascinating... Yeah, sort what of... we're going to uncover about philosophy, yeah. um, it's, you know, it, it will be mind-blowing, I'm sure. Can we move on to ad age? <laughs> you and I talked about this already. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Creatives and AI, why the human touch is irreplaceable. Now, I, I read this, it, it felt like a bit of a motivational tool. A I don't know, of, yeah. Sell, saying, to, saying to ad people, don't worry, AI is not going to take your jobs. You're fine. We still need the creative. But I'm not sure I was convinced, if I'm no, honest. No, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't okay. be. This is a very lovey-dovey piece. And I'm not sure whether I love it or loathe it. It's very sweet, by the way, whoever wrote it. But um, all over social channels, you've seen AI won't replace humans, but humans using AI will replace humans without AI. Now, this piece is mm. all about, look, okay. your human touch is irreplaceable when it comes to marketing text. Can we just be a little bit practical here? I, I'm, and that's true. I think in the future, we crave that human connection. It will actually probably be what makes some things just very different. But at the moment, about not replacing you as a marketer, there are many marketing jobs that I'm sure will still be out there, but there will also be many that won't because AI at the moment, when you can increase glo by global value 50, by tr $15 trillion by 2030, increase GDP globally by 28%, what companies are doing is they're saying, can I use these tools to automate and replace, to augment my labor force and make them more efficient and to personalize? So when it affects your OPEX, your operating expenditure, and you can reduce your labor costs, then that is what some companies will do. So there is some truth to the article, I have some sympathy to it, but it was written by a brand creative agency to marketers who I'm assuming are, are their clients, yeah. right, of large companies. Um, you know, I, it's a very sweet article, but, but, essentially, but I just don't but think But essentially it's true. saying you still have your human creativity, but actually AI can enhance it, is what the article is saying. Yeah. And there is some, there is some truth in that. Some, can although just... Jeffrey Hinton would might disagree. Going right? back to Jeffrey so, Hinton. <laughs> Let's finish with um, ChatGPT, um, which for many people who don't know much about artificial intelligence, probably the one thing they will have really heard about and may have even used is ChatGPT. So it's yeah. quite, it's quite yeah. user friendly, quite big. Uh, apparently it's had a meltdown and it's sending alarming messages to users. This is according to The Independent. Yeah, so it, it did. It started sending out loads of gibberish to people. <laughs> um, at, at one point, I think, in the past, actually, it, it was being really sassy <laughs> and lazy. Uh, look, it could either be bugs in the system, errors in the training data, issues with the algorithms, or what people are calling the temperature. So if you set the temperature of, of the models to being more random and Yeah, what does creative, that mean, set the temperature? Yeah, it's just really... It, it's where you set, essentially, the ability for the model to start being a bit more random. Them, so therefore it just becomes super creative and you can set that to a point where actually it just spouts a load of nonsense okay. but this then goes back to saying well look you know do humans do this if it's understanding the world and understanding how we operate it's already been trained it's already been out there for so long you know would we do that if our brains were intact and so and, ju and you know just a few hours ago just it's hot off the press um, but google gemini disabled the ability for images of people to be created on G google gemini because we saw in the last 24 to 48 hours, it was generating misleading images of people, you know, from r different races in terms of historical context. So you can start to see that this is all about the training data. It is about the algorithms and then about the output. It's highly mathematical. Um, but at the same time, you know, but, but I have to heed Jeffrey Hinton's advice because... Uh, you know, he knows what he's talking about in many senses, and that debate will continue. It's the hottest question uh, in the field at the moment. Well, let's leave it on the hottest question. That's a good place to leave. Priya Lakhani, thank you so much. Thank you.
We are out of time. Um, you will be pleased to know we will be doing this again, same time, next week.